Okay, good morning. So last day we were looking at uh, topic four, uh, sorry, topic three, which was Linux file transfer. As some of you may know, if you were here, we were rudely interrupted by a bat flying around. Understandably, nobody could focus. They were all staring up, hoping that the bat wouldn't swoop down on them. So we ended early for the day. Um, I do not want to fall behind. So what I'm going to do is, if there is enough time on Thursday at the end of the lecture, then I will go back and I will finish that topic. If not, what I will do, it was just the, the last little bit, so I will record the rest of that lecture at home and then post it as part of my regular um, video lectures that I post online and just ask you to just review the last little bit of it. So this week, um, to start, we are going to look at Linux editors. On Thursday, we will be delving into C programming. We are by no means done with Linux, uh, but we need to start on to C programming because assignment two, which will be coming out this evening, gets you to write some C code. So we need to start looking at that. And then for the rest of the course, we're gonna kind of be interleaving C and Linux. Um, yeah, so lab three is going to have you practice using Vim, a very popular Linux editor. We'll talk about that today, and then you'll get some practice with it in the labs. And as I say, assignment two will be out uh, sometime this evening. And I probably will adjust the deadline as well because I realize that I'm a little late getting it out. Okay, so let's dig in here. So today I'm going to just talk about a few uh, general concepts related to Linux editors. We'll look at a very old editor called Ed and why it was sort of influential. Um, VI and Vim, one of the most popular editors for Linux. We'll take a peek at Emacs. I am by no means an Emacs expert, so I won't claim to stand up here and be an expert on it, but I'll, I'll give you a quick intro to it. And then, of course, we'll talk about Nano as well, which you've probably already seen in the labs. So, uh, Linux editors are a bit of a polarizing topic, especially back in the late 90s, back on uh, internet news groups. There were all kinds of flame wars between you know, this group of nerds really likes Vim, this group of nerds really likes Emacs, and everyone had very strong opinions as to why their editor was better than, than everyone else's. My suggestion would be keep an open mind, try a bunch of editors, and see which one works the best for you. And when I call people nerds, I include myself in that, so I'm not denigrating anybody. So, uh, the first thing to understand about Linux editors are the concepts of modal versus modeless editors. So we have modal editors, which, as the name suggests, use different modes for certain operations. So uh, you'll have like an input mode where that's, that, that's the mode you would be familiar with in the editors you use every day. So the, the mode that allows you to type in text. Uh, you can do basic movement around the file using your arrow keys. And then you might have other modes, like some sort of command mode, where maybe it allows sort of more advanced uh, navigation through the file. You can run operations on your, your text, like search and replace, that sort of thing. So modal editors use more than one mode. You're not just in text editing mode at, at all times. Now, for most of us who are familiar with just a modeless editor, uh, that can be a bit jarring at first. So, you know, you might think, okay, they've got a bit of a steeper learning curve. Um, but once you get used to it, it just becomes natural and, and it just makes sense to you. So examples of modal editors would be VI and Vim, which we'll talk about, and the older Ed editor. Modeless editors then are the ones you're all familiar with. You fire up Notepad, you're just able to type, you can move around with your arrow keys, you're in continuous editing mode. Um, if you want to do sort of more sophisticated text editing operations, like a find and replace or something like that, there's usually some sort of key combination that you're able to press, like Alt-X or Control-H or whatever. Because you're already familiar with this sort of editor, it's generally going to be easier for a beginner, uh, but as you'll see with Emacs, it has a ton of key sequences, key combinations that you need to learn. And so I would argue that it has just as steep of a learning curve as VI and Vim. So examples of modeless editors, Emacs, Nano, Visual Studio Code, you know, Visual Studio, Notepad, all modeless editors. And, and just one thing to note, uh, you might not be aware that Visual Studio Code is actually available for Linux. 
So you can install it on Linux and use it there. But we're going to be talking about text-based editors in this course. So before I go on, when you are looking at documentation for certain editors, you will see mention of the meta key. Um, so older keyboards that came with Unix workstations used to have this key that had a little diamond on it, and that was called the meta key. Um, obviously, today's laptops and PCs don't have that key, but editors like Emacs and Nano still make extensive use of that key. So uh, as a Windows user, if you see an instruction to you know, press meta M or meta U or something like that, you're going to use your alt key. That should work most of the time. Alternatively, you can use your escape key. Mac users, you're going to use your escape key. Okay? Um, and you may see in documentation, it's either referenced explicitly as meta or it might be M. So you might see something like, you know, press M U to undo. That means hold down your alt key, or in the case of Mac, hold down escape and press U. OK, so we're starting our look at editors with Ed, which has been billed at least by one person as the most user hostile editor ever created. And I think that's a fairly apt description. So this editor was the original uh, Unix text editor. So Ken Thompson, it's 1969. He's working on Unix. Uh, one of the first three programs he writes is Ed, the editor, in addition to an assembler to translate assembly code into machine language and a shell in order to execute commands. Now, the thing that's weird about it is it's not screen oriented, it is line oriented. What that means is that it will not show you, you know, the contents of your file while you're editing it. It won't even show you the current line unless you ask it to. Um, now that sounds ridiculous in the context of today's computing environment, but you have to remember that at the time they didn't have monitors. They were literally dealing with teletype terminals. So it's hard to see on the slide there, but at the back it was a little spool of paper. And so every time the computer wanted to print some output, it would actually print it out onto that paper and that would be your output. There, there wasn't a screen to look at. So when you consider it that way, it makes a little more sense. We don't want to have this editor spit out an entire screen full of text. We just want it to be as terse as possible and tell us what line we're currently on and only if we ask it to. So um, despite being fairly limited in terms of its user interface, it was very powerful. So you could do you know, just massive changes with, with one command or a few little commands. Um, and what it did was it introduced a very influential concept called regular expressions that we are going to see later on in this course. Uh, regular expressions are used in programming. They're used at the Linux shell. You use them all over the place. They're very, very powerful for text matching. Um, and they have a lot of applications. We'll see that later in the course. Now, one reason you might still use Ed is that it does allow you to script edits. So if you had a bunch of files, and for whatever reason you needed to automate some changes to those files, um, you can write a script and you can have it run Ed commands on that script. I don't think you'd be doing that in 2024. If you needed to do that, you would use a related tool called SED, Stream Editor, which is a fantastic tool that I use all the time. Uh, I don't think most people would be using Ed these days. But we mention it simply because it's an influential editor that uh, later editors like VI and Vim and Emacs took a lot of its capabilities and incorporated them. So I would be remiss if I didn't at least show you what Ed looks like. So let's take our little hello.c example, okay? And let's run Ed on it. So it, it just prints a number. So that's the number of characters in the file. In order to find out where I am, I could say P to print the current line. So it's taken me to the end of the file. If I want to go up to the first line, I just type in the line number. And now I'm on line one, it prints out that line. I could say PN to give me the line number and the line. Maybe we'll jump down to our main function, the next line. And then if I wanted to enter some text, I say A to append. I can then start typing. I am editing this file from ed. This is ridiculous. And then when I'm done appending, I put a dot on a line. And now if we look through our file, 
There we go, we've got our changes. To save, I would say W to write and Q to quit. And if we have a look at our file now, we've successfully edited it from Ed. So, not an editor you're gonna use every day, but again, influential, uh, and later editors took a lot of its features and incorporated them. That brings us to VI, or Vim. I'm gonna talk about Vim, um, but VI was the original editor. Um, it's just for Vim, uh, for brevity, I'm going to call it Vim. So, VI was developed by Bill Joy. He was uh, one of the developers of BSD Unix. He also went on to found a, an influential company called Sun Microsystems. They were eventually acquired by Oracle, but they were pretty big back in the day. They had their own uh, flavors of Unix, Sun OS, and then later Solaris. Uh, so in 1976, he's got this editor that he had already de developed called X, EX, which was very similar to Ed, in that you know it was a line-based editor, and he wanted a visual mode for it. So he implemented an editor called VI, VI being visual mode for X. So you type VI, and now you're in the visual mode of X. And of course, X fell by the wayside, and VI became very, very popular. Um, it was later extended by a guy named Bram Moulinar, who just recently passed away, I think, in August. Uh, he released Vim in 1991, and it has been, he has maintained it. And I think they're up to version 9 now, and now a new group. There's, there's been a succession plan. A new group has taken it over, and development continues on it. And it's a, it's a wildly popular Linux editor. Now, one of the reasons, if for no other reason, one of the reasons you should learn VI or Vim is that you will find at least VI on every single system that you connect to. So if you SSH into some old Unix system, maybe you're a system administrator at a company and your manager comes and tells you, hey, there's this system, I need you to go check this out on it and fix some problem, and you SSH into it and it's some flavor of Unix that you've never seen before, you need to edit some file, you have no idea what to do, you're not gonna find Emacs on there, you're not gonna find Nano on there, but you will always find VI. You might not find Vim, the newer version, the VI improved, uh, but you will always find VI on there. So if for no other reason, that's, that's reason enough. You will always, on any Linux system or Unix system, VI will be there, so it's helpful to have at least a basic understanding of it. And because VI is so popular and Vim are, are so popular, um, most editors that you will work with out there, you can download a plugin for them, so for Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio, IntelliJ, any of the big editors, you can download a plugin that will enable Vim key bindings so that you can still continue to use your editor if you prefer, uh, whatever it happens to be, but you can use all of the uh, fast and efficient VI commands that are available. Now, as I mentioned, Vim is a modal editor, so you have to switch between various modes. We've got modes like command mode and visual mode, replace mode, and so on. We'll see those in a little bit. And as I say, it is confusing at first just to sort of wrap your brain around it, but once you get the hang of it, it's really not that big of a deal. It's extremely powerful, extremely efficient. It takes a little while to sort of build that muscle memory and remember, okay, what was that command again? But once you sort of just have it baked into your muscle memory, um, you just become un unstoppable. You can do a whole lot of things in very, very minimal keystrokes and just run circles around your friends who are still like bumbling around in their little GUI editor. It's also very configurable and extensible. There's a huge community out there, uh, tons and tons of plugins that you can download and install to sort of customize it and make it a full-blown integrated development environment. So, um, again, I've talked about this already. It is notorious for beginners to get stuck in VI or Vim. So if you find that you've gotten stuck in Vim, you are going to type Press escape and type colon Q exclamation mark, okay? What that's gonna do, escape takes you back to normal mode. Wherever, whatever mode you happen to be in, escape always brings you back to normal mode. And then colon Q says quit. The exclamation mark says quit without saving changes. So even if I have unsaved changes, I wanna exit. So it won't save your file, but it'll at least get you out of Vim. 
Okay, so before we look at it, um, just understanding some of the modes. This is simplified. There are more modes than this. Uh, but these are sort of the main ones that you might use on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you load up Vim or VI, you will start off in normal mode. Okay, so that's used for navigating around the, uh, the file. It's used for text manipulation, so deleting characters, deleting lines. Uh, you can run commands like, okay, I want to copy this line, I want to paste it on the line above, that sort of thing. Then we have insert mode. So if I'm in normal mode and I press I, that's going to take me into insert mode. There are also a bunch of other ones to go into insert mode. A, for example, is append, so it'll take you after the current cursor. Uh, capital A will take you into insert mode at the end of the line and so on. But basically, to get into insert mode, you're generally going to press I. And that allows you, that's the experience you would expect from a text editor. That allows you to start typing text. Okay. Uh, command mode. So if I'm in normal mode and say I want to save a file, I will press colon. And that takes me into command mode. And I can now execute a command like W to write the file to save it. I could say Q to quit. Um, there are some other commands like find and replace and so on. That's all done in command mode. Visual mode allows me to select things visually. So if I go into visual mode, I can move my cursor around and select lines, maybe delete them or copy them or whatever. And then replace mode. Uh, I press Shift R, that takes me to replace mode, and I can start overwriting text, replacing text. Starting up VI or Vim, uh, if you just want a new file, you just type Vim. If you want to open a file or create a new file with a specific file name, you'll type you know, Vim and then the file name, obviously. So let's take a look here. We'll look at our hello.c. Now, let, sorry, I'm in. I'm cheating. That was a uh, newer version of Vim called NeoVim. I'm just going to go into classic Vim here so you will see what it looks like. So uh, as I say, we start off in normal mode. If I press I, that takes me into insert mode. OK, so if I press I right here, it takes me into insert mode before uh, the current character. And then I could start typing, I don't know, something else. Um, if I press A, that takes me into insert mode after the current character. Okay, so I is before, A is after. If I do shift A, that takes me into insert mode at the end of the line. I'm appending to the end of the line. Uh, if I do shift I, that takes me into insert mode at the start of the line before the first non-blank character. So a few commands that are useful, again, to quit, you would do colon Q. So I should back up and just explain that if I go into insert mode, I press I. You can see at the bottom, it shows me I'm in insert mode. I make my changes. When I want to go back to normal mode, again, from any mode we're in, we just press escape. So I press escape. Now I'm back in normal mode. And now I can go to command mode by typing a colon. And I could issue a command like I want to write, so W, colon W. I want to write it to a file called hi.c. Press Enter, and now it's been written to the file hi.c. If I want to exit, it would be colon Q. I'm not sure why it's saying that there's no write, but there we go. OK, so colon W to write to save. If I want to save as, I specify the file name, colon Q to exit, colon Q exclamation mark to exit without saving changes. So again, if you're stuck, you've made some changes by accident, I don't know how to get out of here, it's telling me no write since last change, it tells you what you can do to get out. It says add the exclamation mark and that will quit without saving changes. OK, so we talked about some of the insertion commands. If you're in normal mode, you want to start typing text, you press I. That takes you into insert mode. For basic navigation around the file, you can use your arrow keys. That's no problem. That's sort of like the noob approach, OK? So you know, if, you're, if you want sort of a more Vim experience, then you're going to graduate to the hardcore experience, which is using your H, J, K, and L keys for navigation. So, 
that allows you, it, it seems a little silly at first, and you're thinking, okay, why would anyone do that? Uh, once you learn how to navigate around the file this way, it allows you to keep your hand on the home row of your keyboard, which is more efficient than moving it down to your arrow keys. Sounds a little ridiculous, but when you're whipping around a file, um, you sort of want you know, every efficiency possible. Okay, uh, a few other things. GG moves me to the top line. Shift G, so capital G, moves me to the bottom. Uh, if I want to move to a specific line number, I can, from, from normal mode, I can say colon, and then just the line number. So colon 5, colon 1, colon 8, and so on. Uh, one thing that's cool, so when you're editing code, let's look at a JavaScript file. Let's, oh, sorry, I went into NVim again. OK, so let's say that I am here, and I want to jump ahead to the ending parenthesis. I can press percent, so shift 5. And that will toggle me back and forth between the starting and the ending parenthesis. Same with a function. So if I go to a brace, and I want to skip past that function because I want to add a function at the bottom, I just say percent on that. It takes me down to the bottom, and now I can write my new function down here. Uh, if I want to undo a change, it's U. So I press U. I've undone that change. If I want to redo, control R. I don't expect you to remember this just from me sitting up here saying it. Um, it's something you have to sit down and play with, but I'm just sort of giving you a whirlwind tour of, you know, these are some of the major features. Okay, so to understand the power of Vim, you have to understand the notion of operators and motions. So there are a bunch of different operators in Vim. You can press D to delete something, or in other words, cut it. Uh, y is to yank it, or in other words, copy it. C is to change, and so on. Now, if you double up those operators, they will apply to the current line. So if I want to cut the current line, I press D, D, and that gets rid of that line. If I want to copy the current line, Y, Y. And then if I want to paste it, I would press P. Okay, so DD cuts a line, YY copies it, P pastes it. Uh, if I want to paste it above, I would do Shift P, and that puts it above. So those are sort of the basic operators. And then when you combine them with motions, that's when you start getting into sort of the more powerful editing operations. So some of the motions here, to move to the start of the next word, I'm going to use W. So if I press W, that moves me ahead. Now, its definition of what a word is can, can vary depending on what sort of syntax you have in here, what sort of um, symbols you have. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it'll generally move me to the next available word with W. If I want to move to the end of the line, it is dollar sign. If I want to move to the start of the line, it's uh, shift six, so the caret takes me to the first non-blank, zero takes me to the absolute start. Yep? Um, for future assignments, do we have to edit with Vim? Or we, we get to you can decide whatever you want. Okay. Now, so we don't like, need to like, learn Vim necessarily? Uh, well, there will be questions on it on the exam. So you, you do need to learn Vim, yes. Okay. It's tough love. It's tough love. I'm saving you from yourself because your instinct is, I just want to go and use Visual Studio Code because I'm a noob. Sorry, no offense, no offense. But I'm, I'm saving you from yourself. I'm helping you with tough love. I'm showing you the power, making you learn just a little bit of Vim. And maybe, just maybe, you know, even if just one of you decides, yeah, this is awesome, I'm going to use this, I've done my job. But no, to be, uh, in all seriousness, you don't need to, you do need to learn a bit of Vim because there may be some questions on the exam, um, but you, whatever editor you want for the assignments, you can use. Thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, so dollar sign moves us to the end of the line. Caret moves us to the first non-blank. Zero moves us to the start. Okay, and then we can start to combine those with operators. So I could say, all right, 
DW, so D we said was to, to delete. D, uh, w is a word, so DW removes a word. If I want to delete to the end of the line, we said D was delete, dollar sign was the end of the line. So I could press D, dollar sign. And now I've deleted to the end of the line. Um, sometimes it's useful, so F and T. So T will move you, if I say T dot, that will move me right up to bef before the next dot in the line. So let's say I had something like, I don't know, um, my object dot say hello, okay? And I decided I wanted to change uh, this variable name. So I could say t dot, right? t dot takes me right before the next dot in the line. So if I wanted to change that, I could say change. So c t dot, and that will change up to but not including the next dot. And now I can, you know, change the variable name. Now, we can also combine operators and motions with a count. So instead of saying CW to replace a word um, or, or DW to delete a word, I could say 3DW, and that deletes three words. So if I say, hello, this is my demo of Vim, I could say 3DW. I don't know if you guys can see down at the bottom here. It's showing what I'm typing. So 3D and then W, and that deletes three words. OK, if I wanted to delete 10 lines, I could say 10 DD, and that gets rid of 10 lines. Now, visual modes. Whoops. So. Uh, well, let's just quickly make a file here. And once again, I went into the wrong Vim. This is NeoVim. I'll just quickly show you because it's pretty and nice. Um, NeoVim is sort of a newer version of Vim where development goes a little bit faster. And I have installed a plugin called LazyVim, which sort of makes it a full-blown um, development environment. So, you know, it'll give me things like instead of Having my commands down at the bottom, it pops up this little window. Um, it'll give me things like uh, autocomplete. So I don't know if you saw there. It, it, you know, things you would expect in a regular editor, uh, it, will, it will do. So uh, I can hook it up to GitHub Copilot and have it write code for me. I can make it a, basically a full-blown environment. Nevertheless, we are just looking at standard Vim right now. OK, so yank, yank, paste, 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 paste. And so we have these different visual modes. If I press V, that takes me into visual mode. I can move my cursor around, and I can select characters. I could say X to delete them. I could say C to change them. That, that deletes them and takes me into insert mode. Uh, if I want visual line mode, it's shift V. So that just now I'm moving my cursor around and I'm selecting entire lines. And then control V takes me into visual block mode, which I find super useful. So I can select, say, a strip here. And I could say change. And I don't know. I want to do something like that. Or I could say control V. And then I hold down, I, I press Shift I to insert before that block. And now maybe I want to put a space right before all of that. So that can be useful for a variety of purposes. So let's say, I don't know, I've got all of these files in a directory. And they're all called .txt for some reason instead of .txt. And I want to rename them all. And I don't know any other way. So I decide I'm going to try it with Vim. So I do something like this. I say ls-l to you know, some script. That redirects the output of ls-l into a file called script. So we go into here, and now we've got the output of ls-l in our file. And I want to make a little script that helps me rename um, these files. But I've got all this other stuff in here. So I can use my visual block mode. I can press Control v That takes me down here. OK, I can move over here. And then I could press X to delete all of that. It gets rid of all that extra junk. And now I've got all my files in here. 
I could then start writing my little script. I could say I for insert mode, move file 10 to file.txt, file 1 to file1.txt, and so on. Now I could do that. Or, and I don't expect you to remember this, I'm just showing you sort of a, a cool thing about Vim. I could start recording a macro. So I'm going to press Q to record a macro, and I'm going to call it A. So I'm recording the macro A. So QA. Now you can see at the bottom it's recording this macro called A. So first of all, I'm going to say YY to yank, P to paste. I'm going to duplicate that file name. I'm going to go back up. Shift J joins the line. I'm going to go to the start. I for insert, MV. I go to the end with dollar sign. Go over to, press X to delete, and then go down to the bottom, and I'll press Q to stop recording. And now I can just say nine times, so nine at A. So I want you to run the A macro nine times. Nine at A, and there we go. I've got my script written for me. So you can script changes like that using macros. Again, I don't expect you to know this. I don't expect you to, to learn it, but just showing you one of the cool things that you can do as you start to become more advanced with Vim. OK, so we talked about pasting. If you want to go into replace mode, it is Shift R. So if I go into replace mode, I do Shift R. It says replace at the bottom. And now whatever text I type gets overwritten. Um, replacing things. So if I want to replace something, I, I have to be in normal mode. So you press Escape to get back into normal mode. I then type colon. I can say percent %s. What this says is, percent says on every line, I want you to substitute s. Uh, anytime you find file, I want you to substitute it for hello. OK, and then I have to put a, a trailing slash on the end. And that replaces the first instance on every line of file. If I wanted to replace every instance on the line, same thing, percent %s, so on every line, substitute file for hello, except this time on the end, I'm going to put g for global. And that's going to then replace everything. Finally, if I wanted to have it confirm, I could say percent %s, on every line, substitute file with hello, global, and confirm. And then it's going to say, OK, do you want to replace this one first? I say yes. Yes, 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 no, 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 yes, 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 and maybe Q to quit, to stop replacing. OK, so that's find and replace. OK, a couple of my favorites from uh, just doing some software development. If I am in, say, I'm inside of these parentheses, and I want to get rid of this because I want to require some other library. So I want to delete what's inside those parentheses. I can say change inside the parentheses, OK? So CI and the closing parenthesis. CI parenthesis, that removes what's inside of it, puts me in insert mode, and now I can start typing whatever I want. OK, so that's kind of cool. Same with if I'm inside a string. So we have something like var name equals blah. If I'm in here and I want to change this, same idea. Change inside and then the double quote. CI double quote takes me into insert mode and now I can replace it with whatever string I had. Same with single quotes. CI single quote, same idea. So sometimes you'll paste some code or you know you'll be editing and your indentation is all off. What you can do is type gg to get you to the top of the file, gg. You can type the equals operator, which uh, is an indentation or sort of a reformatting operator. gg equals and then capital G to the bottom. OK, so gg gets you to the top. Equals says we're going to indent. And capital G says we're going to indent all the way down to the bottom. So I say gg equals capital G, and it reformats my code for me, and it's nicely indented now. Uh, this one I use all the time. So if I'm, say, writing a Python file, I want to have a nice little uh, header at the top. What I will do is type in 80 times, so 80, 80 times I want to insert, 80i pound. 
press escape, that gives me 80 of these pound characters. Now I'll say YY to copy, to yank them, and I'll say 2P to paste. Okay, that gives me my little block now. Now I want to hollow it out. So I move over with L or with my arrow key, and I say 78, so 78 times, I want to replace 78R space. That hollows it out for me. I press zero to go back to the start of the line, LL, shift R to go into replace mode, and now I can say, this is my pretty file header. Now that takes, it takes much longer to, to, um, to describe that than it does to even do it. So I can just quickly, you know, oops, and then I'm done. And, and I have a nice little file header for my file. I like that, I think that's kind of neat. Okay, um, out of the box, Vim is going to look pretty bare bones. Uh, I've pasted a sample configuration here that you can try out. So if you want to try it out, you can paste it into, uh, within your home directory, a file called .vimrc. Uh, there's just some sensible defaults here. So it enables some colors on um, compute.gall. I've got some color schemes on there. So this puts kind of a nice color scheme, or at least one that I like. Um, it tells it to expand tabs. So we're going to talk about this next day, but one of the things in this course, I am going to make you not use tabs. I want you to use spaces for the code that you hand in. Um, and so this will expand. Every time you press tab, it'll actually put in spaces, and it will tell it to put in four spaces. So four spaces for each level of indentation. So you can check that out if you want to use Vim and you want some sensible defaults for your config, just paste it in that file. Okay, moving on to Emacs. I'm not going to go through a whole big thing again on Emacs. Again, I don't claim to be an expert on Emacs. I use Vim, uh, but just we'll quickly introduce things for you. So Emacs is short for Editor Macros. It was developed by uh, a bit of a zealot called Richard Stallman. He's a bit of a crazy man, uh, fairly strong in his opinions, but um, influential in the open source community, and he wrote a lot of the software that we use today in Linux. So um, Emacs is available both in a graphical mode and a text-based mode. It is not quite as popular as Vim. It does have a smaller fan base, at least according to the stats I see out there, uh, but it does have a loyal fan base. And it is a modeless editor that makes use of extensive key combinations. So you got to get ready to stretch those fingers. You're pressing things like Control X, Control C, and so on. Um, yeah. Very highly customizable, very highly extensible. It includes a built-in language called um, Emacs Lisp, uh, which is a functional programming language that you can basically use to customize it and make it look and do whatever you want it to do. Okay. Um, it is not installed by default. So as I said, you know, if you SSH into a given system, um, you're probably not going to find Emacs on there unless someone has explicitly installed it. You will always find VI or Vim, not Emacs. So same sort of idea here. If you want to start up Emacs, you type Emacs. Um, now by default, at least on my system, if I run Emacs, it's going to pop up this ugly sort of X Windows window, and I don't like that. So I type Emacs. Oh, it's gone into the background here. There we go. And so it does have a graphical mode with you know menus and stuff like that. So if you like that, you know, feel free. I don't like that. I prefer to stay in my terminal when I'm editing. So dash NW keeps you in the terminal, and it puts you into the text mode of Emacs. Um, so. Key combinations, just understanding very briefly here. When you see something like CX, that means hold down the control key, press X. Uh, if you see CXCC, that means hold down the control key, press X, press C, and then release control. Okay? If you see CXU, you're holding down the control key, you press X, you release control, then you press U. And then, of course, we said before that M is the meta key. So for Windows users, you're using your Alt key. For Mac users, you're using escape. Um, sometimes you'll get stuck in Emacs. So if I'm in here and I press like Control X, I don't know. Hold on. 
let's say I type control C, control X, I don't know. And now it's, it's, sometimes you get into a mode where it's waiting for you to do something. So here, okay, find file. Um, I pressed something and now it's waiting for me for more input. I don't want to do whatever it is that I accidentally just typed. So I'll just press control G and that will generally cancel out of whatever operation I invoked. Undo is control forward slash. So if you need to, if you accidentally make a mistake and you need to undo something, control slash. Okay, so the most important part of learning Emacs is learning how to get out of Emacs because what we want to do is just get out of Emacs and then go to Vim. So we press Control X, Control C, and that gets you up. Okay? Uh, saving, Control X, Control S, that sort of thing. Uh, one thing that's kind of helpful is they have a menu, so you can press F10. I can't press F10 right now because Camtasia has taken over F10 and it stops my recording, so I won't do that. But there is a menu there. If you press F10, it lets you, you know, take a look at the various options available to you. So I, again, I won't go through all of this like I did for Vim. Uh, things like deleting characters, deleting words. So anytime you see kill related to Emacs, that just means cut. They call it killing. Um, strangely enough, they call pasting yanking because you're yanking the text back from their, their clipboard or from their, their buffer. Um, so just some differences between Vim and Emacs. If I want to delete a character in Vim, I just press X. Uh, if I want to do it in Emacs, I have to hold down control and press D. So I don't know. To my mind, I find Vim a little more, bit more straightforward. If I want to delete a word in Vim, it's going to be DW, delete word. If I want to delete a word in Emacs, I have to hold down my Alt key and press D. I guess whatever floats your boat. Sometimes you'll find these files that have a little tilde at the end of them. Emacs will often write backup files, so it'll take the old version of your file and write it to a backup file in case you want to revert to it. I find that annoying because now you've got sort of your directory littered with all these backup files, but just something to be aware of. Okay, moving on to Nano. Has anyone taken a course with Laura Reed yet? So yeah, Laura Reed, she, she's nice, she's a good prof. She's been around the department for a long time. She's still repping the Nano after all these years. She's gonna be so thrilled that this is going up on the internet. So Nano, you know, it's not a, a super advanced editor. It's just for basic general text editing. Um, it comes from an older uh, editor called Pico. It's developed as a clone of that. Not nearly as powerful as Vim and Emacs, but um, yeah, it'll get the job done for basic text editing. Um, it is modeless like Emacs, so you don't have to switch between modes like you do in Vim. And again, it's not available by default on most systems. You have to explicitly install it. So again, I'm not going to go through it all again. Um, I will just say, though, that you can see Nano is a little bit more user-friendly in that it gives you the most common functions. It tells you at the bottom what to press. So you can see to exit, Control X, you know, to uh, save a file, to write it out, Control O, uh, you can see undo, you have the MU, so that's the meta key. You're going to press Alt U or Escape U in order to undo. Okay, and then again, just some differences with Vim. Control D deletes a character, whereas in Vim it's X. Uh, deleting a word, I have to hold down Control and go all the way up to my delete key, whereas in Vim it's DW. I've also put a starter configuration in there, so if you want to make Nano a little bit more useful for software development. You can paste that into a file called nanorc, dot nanorc in your home directory. And that'll do things like turn on line numbers and give you a, nice, a nicer color scheme and so on. So which do you choose? Again, this is completely unbiased. We're just giving you objective facts here. If you are new to Vim or you are Laura Reed, then you will choose Nano, okay? Uh, if you find yourself to be more of like an uppity professor type who likes to sort of go on these long-winded diatribes about the, the beauty and expressiveness of functional programming languages and you don't mind repetitive strain injuries from all of the key combinations, Emacs is probably up your alley. For the rest of us, we all choose Vim. Again, objective facts, just giving it to you unbiased, no opinions injected here. 
But don't take it from me. Um, if you look at the developer survey from stackoverflow.com from 2023, it's about 90,000 respondents. Um, obviously, Visual Studio Code wins by a landslide. Uh, but if we take a look at some of the text-based editors, we have Vim at a solid 22%. And then the related NeoVim is uh, another 12%. Nano's down the list at around 9%. And we've got Emacs down around, yeah, less than 5 so yeah, Vim is quite a popular editor. It's not gonna be the kind of thing necessarily that you're going to, it's, it's not gonna replace your editor. For some people it does. I use Vim all day, every day. Um, but I still use Visual Studio. I still use Visual Studio Code. It depends what I need to do. And having it in your arsenal and just forcing yourself to say, yeah, okay, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time. I'm gonna force myself to use this editor. It's gonna suck at first. I'm gonna be really slow with it. But eventually, it's, it's going to catch on. You're going to build that muscle memory, and you're going to be much more effective and powerful once you know it. So that's it. We talked about Ed, the original editor. We talked about Vim, a, mod, a modal editor, Emacs and Nano modeless editors. And I've made you a nice little cheat sheet, uh, at least for Vim, that you can use in your labs. OK, have a good day. We will. See you on Thursday when we will start talking about C.